Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 82, The Murray Williamson Hockey Journey. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pedlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we take the skate guards off the blades, head out for a little shinny and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Little did I know that in the fall of my second season at the University of Minnesota back in 1987, the team welcomed a transfer from the University of Denver by the name of Dean Williamson. I didn't pay much attention to the guy when I heard the news. Since he was a forward, I didn't have to worry about fighting for ice time with him possibly down the road. So we got along great right from the start and ended up becoming roommates that sophomore campaign. Fast forward 35 years to today, it's early January of 2023, and guess who I'm interviewing? My former Gopher roommate all those years ago, it's his dad, Murray Williamson, and until recently, like within the last year, I had absolutely no idea the hockey journey this guy had, the influence he and this underground band of hockey gypsies had on the development of the game in those early years. Not just locally, but nationally and internationally. Though Murray Williamson was a very talented hockey player, his biggest long-term gift to hockey was rubbing elbows with the right people during and after his playing days, helping envision and grow the game to what it is today. The full story is a great read in a newly launched book called The Road to Respectability. Murray Williamson's Role in USA Hockey by John Schladler with Murray Williamson. It's an amazing hockey journey, and I can't tell you how much I enjoyed reading it, but more importantly, I'm grateful the stories were captured, documented, and now available for everyone to treasure as well. Let me do a little rapid fire and give you a few quick snippets from Mr. Murray Williamson's hockey resume. Was teammates with Herb Brooks at the University of Minnesota, and the squad was coached by John Mariucci was an All-American his senior year and named the Gophers MVP that season. Became the U.S. Olympic hockey coach two or three times, I think. Was part of a small group of people that really shaped U.S. amateur, junior, college, and Olympic hockey as it's seen today. In 2001, he was named one of the 50 most significant players and coaches in Minnesota hockey history. And we got him here today on the Hockey Journey Podcast. I've talked enough, and it's time to get this party started. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Murray Williamson to the show. Mr. Williamson, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Well, it's great to be here. I'm not familiar with podcasts, but we're going to give it a good shot. I hope I can uh, inform your your people and uh, uh, to the point where they may run out and buy the book. (laughs) <laughs> and we're going to cover that the book i, I didn't get to it in the, the introduction but it is called the road to respectability and i know that i connected with it uh a lot because there are so many familiar names and faces uh that are attached to minnesota hockey but you were one of the people that no one really heard about and when i read this book murray i uh i couldn't believe the the experiences and what you've amassed over those years and how impactful you and a small group of people 
had on the growth of hockey. So first, let's start by how did the book idea first become something that showed up on the radar? Uh, was it your idea or was it uh, John Schlater? Who, was it, am I pronouncing it correctly, that approached you first? Uh, John approached me and he wanted to do a book on, on me. And I, I said, you know, I, I'm really not interested in doing a book on myself. But if it's a book about all the people that helped and supported Herbie Brooks and myself in our endeavors to in pursuit of uh, Olympic medals, I'd be willing to do that. But again, it's one that's about those people that uh, we've stood up there and got accolades, especially Herbie, uh, but the people behind the scenes who made it all happen, that's who we want to do, include in any book that's being written. And John Shaler is a wonderful writer, did a great job. And uh, it took him uh, about a year to put everything together. He researched everything. Uh, he even had John F. Kennedy on audio, which I heard, talking to his aide and saying, what the hell went on over there? The U.S. has got beat by Sweden 17 to 2. And his <laughs> quote, quote was uh, Hackett, was his aide, said, what's going on? And he said, do we send a bunch of girls over there? And John Shaler said, should we edit that? I said, hell no, you don't edit out the president of the United States. So, um, <laughs> uh, and it, 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 it proceeded from there. And that, that was the, uh, I, I'm in there a little bit, but more than I, I care to be, I'd rather have all those stories that reflect on the success and ventures of all the players that played for me. So talk a little bit about your childhood as we're going to get to the book later on, um, there's this so much information. I, we're never gonna cover all of it. We'd be talking for a year. Uh, but grew up in Canada, wanted to be a Montreal Canadian, and somehow you found yourself uh, in Eveleth, Minnesota. If you backtrack your hockey journey, do you think that's ground zero for you when you met legendary coach John Mariucci for the first time? That was, uh, yeah, yeah, I would say that. Most of my uh, neighborhood buddies were off to, to college scholarships, uh, Michigan State and Michigan, and uh, a couple of situations in Denver. Uh, so that was an incentive for me to, to, to pursue college hockey. And... Uh, we went down, uh, I played for the junior St. Boniface Canadien, went down and played the University of Minnesota. Scared the hell out of us when we heard about uh, Ken Yackel and Masich and Doherty and Anderson and what have you. And uh, before 4,000 4, screaming fans there in Mary Ucher, Williams Arena at the time. And uh, <laughs> we wound up sweeping them. And uh, uh, wow, we, we swept them two game series. And Mariucci, then the legendary coach, said that's the best junior team I've ever seen. And I kind of chuckled because John never went north of Eveleth, Minnesota, to see a junior team. He never ever seen one. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that that piqued my interest. And. Uh, especially Minnesota, that, that caught my eye. And I, when the offer came from John to pursue opportunities there at Minnesota, I jumped on it and uh, shifted Michigan and, and Michigan State to the back burner. So you went to play for the Gophers under John Mariucci uh, in 1959 or 57 through 59 became an All-American your senior year. What did ho college hockey look like back then? Because obviously it, it wasn't, there wasn't as many opportunities as there are today. Uh, was there a professional hockey opportunity available to many college players after they were finished? And did the coaching bug start with hitting you in college, uh, having conversations with Mr. Mariucci and Herb Brooks, or did all that happen after you left? Well, there, there was quite a few uh, uh, 
players came out of college hockey uh, red hay and berenson and some of those that uh, uh, were in that era but college hockey in those days was a little different um there was uh, wally maxwell a neighborhood kid went to michigan but he went to michigan after he'd already played three games for the toronto maple leafs that didn't bother vic Heiler. <laughs> and uh, uh that that was college hockey that that era was wide open at north dakota uh novak ed novak i think his first name was ed uh was a car salesman in winnipeg he'd come down on weekends and play for the fighting sioux so college hockey in those days was very uh, very wide open and uh, very unregulated were there any scholarships or how did that go Oh, there's scholarships all over the place. That there was. was. It, there was a key to it. Scholarships and side jobs. And uh, I, I had a job uh, working at WCCO. You just check in and get a check and go watch the movie in the adjoining uh, studio. Uh, oh, yeah, there was scholarships aplenty back in those days and easy to get. Yeah. But again, like you said, it, it was unregulated, and I'm sure that that was even worse uh, at the professional ranks. They were trying to build college hockey, and, and Mariucci, wanted, he was pro Minnesota boys, but he also understood that he needed some of the Canadian uh, players like Berenson and, and uh, those uh, people to raise the standards of, of the game. And I think Michigan was... 90 percent canadian at the time so what was what was it like uh because we're, we're all have watched miracle on ice you played with her brooks you were uh learning under mariucci uh did did that already start could you see that the chemistry between the three of you and what was going on was going to be something special years later like you were all playing on the same piano really early on but very different ages compared to mariucci um you know we we bonded uh, under mariucci because he allowed the players to the freedom to express themselves on the ice but um that bond came later uh after actually after college because in college herbie was uh lived at home for all his years and i lived in the dorm in pioneer hall so we didn't see much of each other other than on the ice and then after uh we graduated we went on played for the the stairs and the ushl that's when we became closer. So when, when exactly, because uh, that's right around the same time when you started getting into coaching, right? At the international level. And oh, I was up in Canada. Yeah, I was up in Canada and playing in the uh, Ontario Senior League and as a uh, working for uh, International Milling was on a big management training program and. Walter Bush con contacted me and said, why don't you come on back down and we're starting a team in the United States Hockey League and we'd love to have you come down and play and coach. And I jumped on that. I wanted to get back to Minneapolis. My wife and child were, uh, that was home for them. So you, <laughs> you finished college and you're playing at then what was the USHL uh, which is what minor league pro league, right? Uh, working, yep. uh, have a young family. <laughs> I mean, it is nothing like what hockey is today. I mean, that's crazy. How did you do it? Well, it was, we, we loved the game and we had some great, great players, Billy Masterton and Georgie Connick, and these were all legendary All-American players and pros eventually, but there were no real opportunities uh, in the National Hockey League for guys that had degrees and could 
make more money in the business world than they could playing hockey. That was the case of uh, of Connick and Masterton and and actually Nanny was part of that group too, I guess. Well, you you uh, mentioned a number of people. We've both been. Uh, when I read this list of names to you, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, Ken Austin, John Blanick, Herb Brooks, Harry Brown, Walter Brown, Warren Brown, Walter Bush, Don Clark, Bob Fleming, Vic Heiliger, you mentioned John F. Kennedy, Tom Lockhart, Gordon Martin, Cal Marvin, John Mariucci, John Masich, Doc Nagabogs, Lou Nanny, Bob Peters, Bob Ritter, Glenn Sonmore, Alatoli Tarasov, Hal Trumbull, Thayer Tut. Because if I mention any of those people who are crazy famous in the hockey world, you're entwined with each and every one of them. You guys were the hockey pioneering spider web. So how did that when did that all kind of come into being or did it just kind of evolved and you really didn't notice it until the book, the road to respectability was put together. That, I think that's, that's, that's true. The, uh, those people that we mentioned, uh, Bob Fleming was the most selfless, uh, considerate leader. He was, a uh, steady as you go now he had herbie brooks was his coach and the olympic team and he fleming was it and they had me during a couple of years i mean for those two to supervise williamson and brooks and keep the headlights between the ditches was none of that stuff would ever happen without him yeah and unfortunately he, he he's got a uh uh, in the Hall of Fame as part of that 780 team. And I would lobby for him to be as an individual uh, in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And they said, well, you know, that we weren't political enough. And he was the most unpolitical person. He cared about his, his teams and he kept the headlights between the ditches. And to supervise two characters like Williamson and Brooks, that took a handful. <laughs> and... Uh, there would be no gold medal or silver medal uh, uh, return to respectability without Bob Fleming. Yeah. And uh, he gave credit to everybody but himself. Right. So when when did it happen to where you, for, you know, said, I'm done, I'm done as a player and I'm, I'm going into this uh, coaching and to really try to uh, build the U.S., international program to where it was when you started getting involved in it? Well, the, we coached, uh, played and coached for the St. Paul Steers. You know, we won a roster of eight or nine people and Walter moved on to a team in the Central Pro League and turned the team over to me, actually sold it to me. Uh, he never got paid. But, <laughs> um, and we barnstormed the country and it came time to schedule exhibition games uh, with the, the Swedish team that was touring. We beat them. And I think that's documented. We tied a Russian traveling team and we gave Kenny Yackel's uh, uh, national team all they could handle. I mean, and they came to me and said, we, you know, we need your players. And I said, you can't have my players. We, we've got commitments at Denver University, North Dakota, Michigan, you know, all over the place. So they said, well, why don't you be the national team then? I said, oh, that's what? interesting. Where are they? Where's the world championships in Vienna, Austria? I said, oh, boy, that's even more interesting. Yeah. I think we'll do that. So, um, uh, and we were very successful. We, probably the, the best showing since uh, uh, the, the, the 60 gold medal that McCartan won. So uh, that was the beginning of the road to respectability. There was ups and downs, many of them, but that was basically the start of it all. 
So you basically had a team and they did really well. You got noticed and they, they couldn't figure, they couldn't beat you. So they're like, let's, let's get him on board and give him the reins to the, to the city. And that's how it all started. That's how it all started. Right? So <laughs> and I, I was a nationalized uh, American. I, I wanted to play in the national, uh, in the in national uh, world championships. So I had to get my citizenship and, uh, you know, it wasn't well received uh, that a Canadian uh, was coaching the national team, the Olympic teams. And they came to me, Bob Fleming came to me and he said, you know, there's a lot of people that want to apply for that job. And I said, well, <laughs> that's fine. Give it to them because uh, uh, I don't interview for a job that uh, – a team that I've built, right. and uh, he, you know, he, he said, "Okay, we we'll, we'll go with you. That's that's the way it is." And I said, "No, that's fine." But we came to the Olympic year a year later. The, the politics got involved, and we had to. Uh, they wanted Mariucci as the coach, and I'd be the GM, and that was that was a disaster. And uh, my mentor. And, great friend Marouche uh, was having lots of lots of uh, personal problems so it didn't work out very well but we got the boat turned around we got the boat turned around yeah we, we it, it, it took took some uh, <laughs> behind the scenes maneuvering on my part to get that changed and John uh, such a great graceful guy he said what are you doing, Murray? You, you, I know what your, I know what your problems are. We're doing bad, and you, and you you're going to make a change. He said, "Go ahead, make the change. I'm with you all the way." So and that was it. I took over. It was coaching, and we got the ship righted, and back on track. And Marouche was there every bit of the way, supporting. And uh, I think they gave him a, a job at the for the North Stars and. Uh, they didn't, Ren Blair didn't treat him very well, and I, I really resented that. Yeah. Interesting. It's uh, it's funny how relationships change over time um, because a lot of it happens because of the politics of hockey, because someone has to abide by the rules from someone that's uh, higher up, and it affects relationships down the ladder. That's tough. So, one of the people on the list that I read is Anatoly Tarasov, and I'd like you to chat about your relationship with him over the years. <laughs> but first, let me set up this section. Back when I started coaching in the early 2000s, one of the books I came across was called The Hockey Handbook, which was written by a guy named Lloyd Percival. And basically, he was Canadian. He wrote a, uh, a book, that book in 1951, to help uh, improve the game of hockey up in Canada uh, and basically was laughed off the stage, so to speak, by the decision makers at the time. Uh, the book finds its way over to Russia and into the hands of Tarasov, and apparently that was one of the major reasons and uh, births of the Soviet national program. And you got to hang out with them once he learned everything and trained and they became big and famous. You somehow got to go over there and hang with them. And he shared basically everything with you, didn't he? he yeah. Oh yeah. He was uh, an unbelievable person. He, the, the, the Ace Percival's uh, book was his Bible. That's where he got it started. Uh, he adopted a lot of those Things and and you're right. The, the, the people in Canada laughed at him. You know, he, he's using Ace Percival's book to build a Russian team. Well, he he built a dynasty, and uh, uh, his big goal. And we spent quite a bit of time together. His goal was, first of all, to go to a National Football League training camp when Bud Grant was running the Vikings, and uh, was to play a game against any team in the National Hockey League that he said we would beat. And I couldn't 
uh, I couldn't pull either one of them off, but they did happen. Well, we didn't get to, to visit the, the Viking training camp, but uh, uh, he saw a lot of their training habits and he used those. Well, he, he thought out, out of the box. There was no, no, he was an amazing man. And uh, he was so into his partners that it cost him his job. He came to me in 1972. He said, uh, Williams, Williams, I'm a general without an army. Because they fired him because he wasn't political enough. And uh, it cost him uh, the 1980 gold medal. Yeah. Uh, wow. So that's the way it was. He loved his players. And Tikhonov took over. He thought his players were just uh, robots. But Tarasov loved his players. And they loved him. A quick word from our sponsor, Sniper's Edge Hockey. Sniper's Edge Hockey is your one-stop shop for your at-home hockey training needs on and off the ice. Find the perfect start to your at-home training area with slick tiles, synthetic ice, or a rink liner. Or upgrade your home setup with one of our top quality training tools to help you work on soft hands, all of your deeks and dangles, perfect your one-timer, and improve the power and accuracy of your shot. Find it all online and in stock for immediate shipping at snipersedgehockey.com. Yeah, there was some thing on uh, Netflix that shows the, uh, it's the opposite of the miracle on ice, uh, but it goes into the, the history of um, the Red Army and, and the Russian hockey, and it was pretty cool to see. So what do you, what do you think was your greatest takeaway from the, you know, the early time you got to spend with him over in Russia? What was the t best takeaway? Just I, I, I learned from him and uh, on off dry land training and what it took to get a, a team conditioned. You didn't uh, rest all day and play at night. You trained in the morning and played at night, you know, two a day. And, and uh, uh, that was that was the key to it. And our team was so well conditioned when we broke camp in 72 henry bushy went to detroit scored a goal in the first 10 seconds i think it was a record and tommy miller we got tangled up with uh schultz and whipped his butt and that was according to uh ned harkless who coached detroit at the time uh it was we we're so well conditioned and schultz didn't know what the hell he, he got tangled up with and tommy miller was not that big a guy but he was well conditioned and tougher than hell, but so. But what for for what I'm what I'm hoping to to gain? Like you went over there, you saw something. So you're telling me that what you were seeing over there it was non-existent in the U.S. and you introduced it to to the training methods, and it sounds like you figured out that you could push players harder than you were currently pushing them. That, that's 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 correct and uh he made it fun i mean they worked hard and, and my players in 72 they, they had fun they worked they worked hard uh extra hard but i made it fun it was fun for them i'm not that i made the fun but some of the people on that team the chemistry got got it going and uh to, even to this day uh they're communicating uh, almost weekly, Miller, McGlynn, uh, Robbie Fritorek, Marky Howe, uh, that bond stayed forever because they worked hard, accomplished something, and uh, uh, that bond prevailed. But, but you never get any satisfaction unless you're working your buns off. Then the, what you accomplish something, you look back and say, hey, hard work really paid off. And that extra effort, and it was fun doing it. It was painful, but it was fun when you look back on it. Yeah, a story that kind of pops into my head was when your son Dino and I were at the University of Minnesota, and back then the old football stadium um, was a memorial stadium. They had converted the uh, football locker room into the hockey weight room, 
for the hockey players. And uh, I think the gymnast used it too. But I remember, I think it was my freshman summer, Mike Ramsey, who played in uh, the NHL, won an Olympic gold medal on the 80 team. He's, he's riding the bike and he goes, you want to, you want to have a workout with me? And I'm like, sure. And I've never <laughs> had a more challenging bike ride than that. But at that point in time, I had my level of what was the hardest I've ever worked. And I saw he showed me there was a different level and um, that benefited me. And you saw a different level when you saw how the Russians were training and you passed it on. And that seemed to be kind of a, a staple with all the, the people like Herb Brooks, you know, that came with you after Mary Uchi and Masich, that that was kind of a staple that all your teams were just really skilled, but they had a work ethic that was like no other. No others. Yep. The, uh, the Russians came over. They got beat a couple of times, but they beat most of the pro teams. And they, uh, and I was following up when they play uh, the Buffalo Sabers uh, beat them, uh, be only because it wasn't a hockey game. It was a, a slug match, you know. And that that, that was uh, some of the philosophies that we adopted. If you're going to compete with the Czechs, the Russians, you got to be very physical with them. But the only problem with being physical, the Russians, they were tougher than hell. They were in, they were in very good shape. And yeah. so you just had to hang on as best you could. Um, the, that Summit Series was one when uh, Bert Olmstead, who was one of the assistant coaches for Canada, was, and it, it was a very shameful act when he told Clark off, you, Clark, Bobby Clark, if you want to win this series, you got to break Karmanov's leg, and yeah. he broke his ankle with with a vicious slash, and that changed the series. Oh, if you've never, oh, if you've never seen it, it's he should be in prison. There's people that are in prison doing less time for what what you saw in that video. It was brutal. Yeah. Oh, and uh, it just it wasn't. Uh, I mean, you can go and be physical and bouncing around, but to, to injure the star player like that, uh, you know, that's that mentality doesn't function in, in today's uh, game. If somebody did that in the National Hockey League right now, they'd be suspended for multi, multi games. Yeah, and, you know, when you were coaching, you get a little angry at the refs and somehow the all the extra sticks and out on the ice surface, you don't see that anymore either oh. because that's not the normal anymore. <laughs> oh, you, you got to stick. The officiating has improved so dramatically. A lot of people won't agree with that because they don't like officials, but uh, it, it has. And uh, it's cleaned up the game. I mean, it, to the point where almost there are too many penalties. Yeah, yeah, at all times. Um, so let me ask you this, Murray, as we kind of move out of the international um, hockey here, out of all your international USA hockey experiences, can you put one of them in the top spot? Um. Not well when I watched the uh silver medal ceremony, and uh, you know, the coaches aren't on the ice. You know, when I watched the boys, Mark Howe and Fatorik and Sheehy and Christensen get, get their medals, that was a highlight. That was a highlight. Uh, I think well, the other one, the other one, we played Syracuse Stars. And we were, you know, we were working two a day and what have you. And people came down and said, "Wow, you got to come and see this team." We were moving pucks so fast and doing, we we kind of revolutionized the eyes of the people in Syracuse, New York. They'd never seen anything like that. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So when you look back, well, that's yeah. It's hard to put anything because uh, at the top spot because there's. All of them have moments, and some of them uh, are tough moments. 
you know, I'm sure that there was some time where, you know, you guys had some heartbreak, but then the next Olympics or tournament, uh, you triumphed. And maybe it was because of that heartbreak that, that got you over the hump. I don't know. You know, I, I think of the cover of the book, I think it shows the uh, Huffer Christensen, the uh, greatest captain any Olympic team could ever have receiving the silver medal with uh, uh, 16 year old Mark Howe in the back row and Robbie Fatorik and uh, 19 year old and they all went on to Hall of Famers. I think about that team, uh, uh, a lot of Hall, Hall of Famers and jerseys are retired in their respective uh, arenas, Boston College, Sheehy, Miller, uh, Jimmy Lowe, you know, those are, those are, those are the highlights of my life. Seeing, yeah. seeing those successes and I've kind of drifted on. I don't, uh, uh, I don't politic. I was the most unpolitical person ever to, I make, uh, uh Billy Martin look like a tame duck. So <laughs> Herbie Brooks was smarter and a better politician. He could, uh, you know, he, he could get it done. And, uh, he was a smooth, he was smart very smart and, uh, and, and very, very, very focused. It was scary to go to dinner with him because you want to do X's and O's and, you know, you like to rather tell stories. But, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's so cool. So we've been bouncing around uh, and not really getting too dialed in on any story. But the, again, the book is The Road to Respectability. Pick up a copy. It's such a great read. <clears throat> I find myself rereading a lot of the, the sections over again just because it's just a lot of knowledge to grasp. But when you look back at the moments when, you know, Mayus, it's Mariucci, Herb Brooks, you know, all these hockey minds here in Minnesota, uh, you, you, got, you were one of the people that carried on their vision. Uh, did the vision after so many years come to fruition? What you guys were talking about that back then, growing the game, uh, you know, did it happen the way you hoped? So, you know, the, the book is, there's Murray, there's a website that this, uh, my aide set up, Murray Williamson. Uh, uh, I think I'll have to look it up. <laughs> I'll find it. We'll get and, it and the, the book is on sale now for 25 bucks and i think we uh, they cover the postage um just a moment here um, it's uh yeah it's um murray dash williamson.com or beth getting organized now.com and the books it's uh, I think Jack Norquell, who, legendary hockey aficionado, uh, ordered two books and on that site. That was the last I, I saw. That was a couple of days ago. So anyway, if, if nice. those that are interested, it, uh, it's a it's not a disc for hockey people. I've had a lot of people comment on the entertainment of the book. Um, oh the history and what have you it's not just uh, he shoots he scores and uh, it's more about the people behind the scenes the legends oh, behind the teams. <laughs> yeah so, i don't consider myself a legend i consider my, myself a very lucky guy so i would say pioneer you know and you you were in the right place at the right time with the right mentality where you know you were all about giving and growing you know which was and we're all the benefactors you know i was my kids my kids were and we're grateful for that so um one thing that you did and i'm curious for many years is you had a hockey camp summer camp up in northern minnesota in bemidji uh how did that start and was that part of something bigger than just a summer camp? Because a lot of the people that uh, we mentioned earlier, the Ken Yackles, Herb Brookses, uh, was this a way 
to grow the game nationally because it seemed like all of you had your own individual camps and that the spider webbed, you know, to Michigan, to Massachusetts, to New York. Was that talked about or that just happened? That's just what was going on at the time. That was up in uh, Bemidji, Bob Peters. And uh, uh, the first year, uh, we called it the Olympic Development Hockey Camp. Well, they got a little gun shy on that name, they, they, you know, because I wasn't. Uh, so we have to change it to the Bemidji International Hockey. Well, the first year, uh, Paul Holmgren won a scholarship to it his uh, brother and he mentions that many times of how that got him started and uh there weren't that many people there and it just grew and over a period of years thirty-three thousand kids went through that camp uh, wow uh, speech uh, eric hyden was a prominent member billy baker was there for seven straight years uh it was uh, it, it, the business just grew. It was the first one in the country, in the world almost. We had 23 different states represented, and I think five European nations represented over a period of of years. So yeah, we didn't talk very much about it. Peters and I were both uh, uh, more reserved, and we didn't uh, run around blowing each other's horn. So, but no. So let me get this straight. You had more than just the camp up in Bemidji, Minnesota. You would go, you would have teams and go do camps and clinics worldwide? No, we never, we went and did a camp in uh, Kansas City, but the, 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 that was all. We didn't expand, just kept it uh, up there, you know. Oh, you're just up there, okay. Yeah, we, we didn't. But it, it originally... You were, did it have a little tie to the national development program? No. Where that's originally where it was going to maybe start from? It was totally independent, became a business. Uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, the competition for play, for t teachers, you know, everybody was building rinks around the, the country and that, and they, High school coaches, what have you, had to serve those clinics. So it became a problem getting the quality of coaches that we wanted. Um, so uh, we decided uh, it was time to move on. Uh, I had other business ventures and uh, the, the Bemidji University wanted a bigger piece of the pie so we said you know that's it yeah but it was no 33, I, 000, I remember 33 thousand kids went through that king 33 years or a thousand kids a year or so uh that's an unknown fact i'm glad you asked about that i forgot about it <laughs> yeah no pretty cool because i was up there and it's a it's a beautiful campus what you had going on and um stayed at your lake place that was awesome so one thing that i think came to you and i later in life after our kids because we you had three boys i had uh two boys uh is the girls hockey because uh you had some granddaughters that went on with kendall and taylor to to play college hockey uh and me uh what i do i started primarily training male players and now it's completely flipped since my boys are uh, at college and pro level where I train more girls now that I do boys. The one uh, fact that I found out, I believe from your brother, uh, Bob May was the pioneer, I believe in Minnesota here for girls hockey, but you also uh, were one of the first to have a, a girls hockey camp, if not the first up in Bemidji years ago yeah we had one one session you know we'd have 11 sessions a week a, a summer and we dedicated one to um women and i think a lot of the key, you know, some of the gals that came out of that first camp went on and played on the original uh gopher camp played for laurel halderson so um and that's another story Lori halderson asked me if she introduced her to Rudy Luther. 
And I said, because they do so much support. And I said, yes, you come on over to Olympic Hills and I'll set it up. So there was Rudy sitting there with a couple of his cronies and I brought in Laura and I said, uh, uh, Rudy, this is Laura Holderson. She's start starting a uh, the Gopher Women's program at the university. And uh, he asked her a couple of questions. She said, yeah, I'm getting a little heat. I want Minnesota kids only. Uh, they, they want, they, you know, Rudy looked at her and said, ma'am, no, no. You go for the best if you want to be successful, regardless of where they're from. So yeah, yeah. that was Laura Halverson. You know. A lot of stories. When you get older, that's the only thing you're good at. <laughs> well i mean it's it's i hung up my skates that, and i hung up my golf club and i'm afraid now my wife might hide my car keys so <laughs> <laughs> uh well it's it's interesting how a lot of what you said because it, it filtered down to to me and what i went through is that when i played for the university of minnesota uh you know it's been said several times by you by you and other people you know all minnesota we want the vision is to have all Minnesotans. Well, I only played with uh, two people that were not from Minnesota when I was at the University of Minnesota, and that was John Blue. He was from California, and then Steve McSwain uh, from Alaska. But I keep hearing you saying you don't, you can't just stay in Minnesota. We got to have that as the focus, but you got to go where the best players are because if you want to be the best, you got to have the best there, right? Yep. Yep. So, um, all right. I one of the most prestigious hockey tournaments that has just concluded, and I got this from your son Dino. Um, the World Junior Hockey Championships. Um, he said, "Ask him about the history of that tournament, and just listen." So that's what I'm doing. What do you know about the World Junior Hockey Championships? Well, that's probably as good a hockey as I've ever seen. Uh, I watched it, the cool. overtime games, and the quality and uh it was incredible watched it uh and that was something that uh we started uh b back in 1973 that was the first world uh, junior tournament it was in uh, russia and uh then we moved the next year to canada and the usa hockey was very leery they weren't th that involved they weren't sure of this thing was uh a viable uh, tournament and uh, then all of a sudden they said mm, maybe there's something there so they got involved in the third year and then they took credit for the whole the whole ball of wax so uh, <laughs> i said uh, congratulations to art berglund uh, on being the first uh, coach of the manager of the world junior team and i said but that's not really true uh, so don't take away from the players that played on those first two teams, Gary Sargent and uh, Giving and all those kids that played in that first uh, World Junior and second year. And they said, well, uh, we didn't make it official until uh, the, the third year. So, but uh, Sports Illustrated recognized that as the first World Junior team. Yeah. Wow. It's so much history. It's so neat. I mean, I was just a kid under a rock when all this was going on. So yeah. it's just neat. So last question before we wrap it up. Um, with all your experiences, what's the one quality, habit, or character trait you're glad you made part of you? I think this... From a success standpoint. Um I really don't have an answer for that. I, I don't know. There's so many different things. Um, I think just love and respect your players. Treat them as family. They'll get to, they'll play back. That's, that, that's, you know, Hunter's coaching a B team. And I said, give your players all the respect they can and expect it back. If you don't res get respect from them, get rid of them. And, uh, if you don't respect your players, they'll get rid of you. So that's that's the key. You, yeah. you, you got to respect and love your the people you're dealing with. Uh, your son and your daughter 
uh, had, took a coaching gig here in YZ, Minnesota, at the high school girls level for a few years. Um, did they lean on you a little bit for some coaching advice during that stretch of time? No, I don't say much. I have some observations. I just go and enjoy watching them. Um, I, 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 I don't offer anything unless I'm opinions are solicited. So otherwise, I just yeah. enjoy watching them and uh, I get a little upset when they identify me as a, a pylon in the pod hockey games. And uh, <laughs> instead of saying, uh, uh, watch out, Grandpa, get the hell out of the way. You're, you're interrupting the pond <laughs> game. So I hung up my skates. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I just... It's pretty cool to revisit with you all these years later. Um, thank you for your contribution to the to the hockey world, not only as a player, a coach, but just uh, being part of that band of hockey gypsies that thought outside the box uh, and really were selfless people who put the growth of the game and the people within it as the highest priority and themselves at, at the, the bottom of the totem pole. So thank you, Murray, for taking the time for this conversation and all that you have done to, to grow and make the game of hockey what it is today. Thank you very much, Lance. You were a great player, and thank you for what you did for Dean when you were back at the University of Minnesota. Well, if it was fall down... Uh, and trip him. <laughs> I was very good at that, but uh, thank you. Uh, enjoyed the conversation. I'll put the uh, the links that you mentioned earlier to the book, The Road to Respectability. Um, I think you mentioned there's a $20 uh, discount going on right now, but I'll put that in the description. And uh, I hope that 2023 this is the best one yet for you yet, Mr. Williamson. Thank you for being on the Hockey Journey podcast. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lance. You take care and good luck to you and your boys. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed the Murray Williamson Hockey Journey. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.